Hey everyone, Janie here. Welcome back to my garden. So today's kind of an interesting fun day. Today we're gonna focus on my cut flower garden right here at my home. This cut flower garden is about 10 foot by 20 foot. I've been planting flowers in here. I've been specifically planting cut flowers in here for I think I'm on my fourth round of flowers in there. And so what I like to do is every year, I like to amend the soil with some organic compost. I get my compost delivered from a local landscape, um, you know, landscape supplier. I will link the one that I use below if you guys are local to my area, because I really do think they're fantastic. They're so nice, they're so sweet and so accommodating. And the, the guy that delivered this, he even said, do you want me to drop it? Do you want me to put it right on the, the garden bed to make it easier for you and not just in the middle of the driveway? So that saved me a bunch of time on work and, and getting the, the compost transferred over. I ordered about two cubic yards. It's probably gonna be a little too much because you only need to add a couple inches uh, to amend your soil each season but I am gonna take a couple wheelbarrow full wheelbarrows full to my backyard to put it in my vegetable garden my kitchen garden uh, to amend that soil as well so this past season specifically the third round of cut flowers that I did this year I did notice some pretty significant issues going on in my cut flower garden one of them the main one was my sunflowers. My sunflowers were a total bust this year. Every single sunflower that I grew was only a couple feet tall and it was really scrawny and thin and had these tiny little blooms. Even my pro cut plum sunflowers, which should be nice and tall and good cut flowers, it they were just horrible. The other thing that I had trouble with was my ornamental broom corn. And my neighbor, Daniel, he's actually an agronomist, which is a specialist in soil management and crop production. He kind of had a couple tips for me and said that it looked like I had some nutrient deficiencies. So the first thing I did is I went to the garden center and I picked up some of those over the counter, um, you know, square soil test kits to see if I could find any deficiencies myself. So I'll show you a little video right here of what I found. Basically every single nutrient was depleted in my ground. And I kind of already knew that, but I thought it would be better. And I was speaking to Daniel and he thought it would be better if we got a little bit better picture as to what really was deficient and what I needed to amend my soil with to have a good crop next year. All right, everyone, this is Daniel, my neighbor. He is, he works for Della Valley. Did I say it right? Della Valley Laboratories. Della Valley Laboratories. It is a local laboratory here in Davis, and he is an agronomist and a certified crop advisor is that right can you believe yeah. that my neighbor does this i just think it's crazy <laughs> so you saw my corn and you saw my sunflowers what do you think the issue was it looked like a clear nitrogen deficiency to me okay so tell me a little bit about what your laboratory does and then do you work with homeowners or do you work more with the big uh you know farming crop yeah. you know, farmers. So we are an agricultural testing lab and we do primarily work with, uh, um, you know, large growers, you know, that are farming hundreds, thousands of acres. Um, <laughs> but we get the homeowner inquiries as well. And, okay. you know, I'm, I'm a gardener, you're a gardener. Yes. Um, so, you know, we, we're always uh, doing a little testing uh, at home as well. And we get inquiries from homeowners and commercial landscapers. And we, uh, we try to help out people uh, as we can. And we've got little uh, different analytical packages depending on their budget and what they need to know. Okay. Uh, I think the most uh, important uh, thing to consider is that you've got probably nationwide audience. I do. Because <laughs> Janie is popular. Oh, <laughs> With soil testing, there are different testing methods in different parts of the country. Oh, okay. So it would not be appropriate for somebody, say, in New Jersey to send a soil sample to a laboratory like ours in California. Okay. And conversely, it's not appropriate uh, for somebody in California to send their um, soil sample to, you know, a lab in Nebraska that's cheaper than labs in California because right. they do different testing methods. Okay. okay. So here in the um, 
arid to Mediterranean uh, western climate, we have Western States methods. Okay. And east of the Rockies, there is the Midwest. Okay. And then there is also another group of methods for the Northeastern States and the Southeastern States. Okay. So it's real important to work with a laboratory in your general region that does the appropriate tests. Okay. So in uh, lower rainfall areas like California, mm -hmm. us, um, salinity can be an issue, water quality can be an issue, whereas those are really not common issues in the Midwest. Oh, okay. So we do separate tests for salinity that they don't do in the Midwest. Because they get all this snow and rainfall and salts just don't accumulate. Right, yeah. like us when we don't get any rainfall yeah, for yeah. months and months on end. Yeah. Okay. So, so the mail out soil tests, you think that unless they're local, it's probably not the way to go. Well, I, 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 I'd work within either within your state or within a couple of states in your, in your region. Okay. Yes. All right. What do you think about the over the counter? Um, <laughs> those cheesy little things they sell at the lawn and garden aisle. I, I, I can't wait to compare our results because I actually I've never done that before. Okay. All um, right. But in general, with most things that you buy, you get whether what you it's pay for. exactly, <laughs> you, get what you, pay for. you get what you pay for. How often do you think people should test their soil? Well, so for a homeowner, Oh, not that often, really. Okay. Um, like once a year, once no. every okay. every maybe every couple of years. Okay. And, and you might even just do it once and say, well, okay, everything's good except I'm low in nitrogen, and all the other nutrients aren't going to go anywhere. Okay. Um, nitrogen is mobile; it can uh, leach with water, rainwater, irrigation water, and it's the uh, element that is most often limiting plant growth. Okay. Uh, nitrogen is what generates, um, drives vegetative growth, makes stuff nice and green. Uh -huh. And uh, when there's a nitrogen deficiency, like you had in your ornamental corn, <laughs> it, it'll start turning Daniel, pale yellow. Daniel noticed it very <laughs> yeah. and, and and He informed it, both Jason and I that I had a nitrogen deficiency. Yeah, I, I just wanted to rush over here with some fertilizer. <laughs> With, with a nitrogen deficiency, nitrogen is a mobile nutrient both in the soil and in the plant. So you'll first start to see a nitrogen deficiency symptom as a general yellowing, uh, but also the yellowing of the lower leaves because the newer growth up top is pulling the nitrogen from those lower leaves because there isn't enough for the entire plant. So okay. you'll always start to see a nitrogen deficiency uh, at the basal leaves. Okay. So have you heard of that app called Soil Lab from through UC Davis? Yes. Yeah, so that's the Soil Web. Oh, Soil and, Web. Yeah. Yes. And uh, it is, um, it's just a, a overlay of the USDA soil survey uh -huh. onto Google Earth, okay. which is a very common user friendly program. Right. And we use it all the time okay. in our work okay. where I can just pull up the um, the soil web I can uh, hit my location and if you just google uh, soil web right. uh, it will bring it up and you can download the app yeah and when I go here it just picks up uh, our location and then I can easily look up what the soil type is do you find that that's pretty accurate? Yeah. So okay. uh, what's really funny is um, uh, where we are standing around the corner from our house, uh, there is a, a, a contour line of uh, two different soil types. And we're kind of oh. right at the border. Oh, funny. So we could, you know, the border isn't real precise. It could go know. either way. We're, we're, we're like right over the back fence yeah. here. Um, <laughs> so if I look at, I know what ours is. Ours is a yellow, fine, sandy loam. I think that that's what mine was. And if we look at yours, you're on a rife. Oh. It's a loam, which is a, a nice medium soil texture where there's relatively e um, equal proportions of sand silt and clay so okay. it, it is 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 got you know it's easy to work it holds water and nutrients quite well where around the corner where we have the yellow fine sandy loam mm -hmm. and what's really interesting 
is uh, I'll show you my little uh, uh, soil sampling tool and, and I'll use it in the yard. And it's really handy to check for moisture as well. And so I, I'll check, I, I, when we used to have a lawn in the back, I'd check it periodically, see how deep the, the irrigation's getting. It is a, a very um, nice, sandy, uh, medium textured soil. Mm. Whereas out in the front yard, it's heavy it's clay. It's crazy. It's crazy. And, it can and, be so different. But then 18 inches underneath is that same nice sandy loam soil. Funny. And so why is there 18 inches of clay in our front yard above the soil that is mapped for our address? Right. That all has to do with construction. So when they oh. cut and fill the roadways and they are bringing in fill to raise a house pad, they're bringing in whatever they can haul in whatever. as close as possible. Okay, and so that so makes sense. And so they don't, yeah. they, you know, construction, they don't care about, you know, what kind of soil is matching. <laughs> they don't care about your garden. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. okay, so that's interesting. Yeah, so it, it's a very artificial soil. Got and it. that's one thing that homeowners need to keep in mind is just because it says one thing on that uh, soil survey isn't necessarily going to be what you find because uh, home sites are generally highly, highly uh, manipulated uh -huh. and they're moving earth uh, left and right. Okay. So, so if you live in a neighborhood like we do, it's uh -huh. probably smart to get your soil tested just based and, on... And also when you're, when you're collecting the sample, you will learn a lot. Okay. So down the street, there was this, uh, my mom had had this uh, mound in the backyard and stuff just wasn't growing there. She says, can you test that? So I go, no. sure. And I'm collecting the soil sample and I go, man, this is hard. Oh. And I remember that. I get the, the results back and everything is fine uh, nutritionally. It's the hard soil that was impeding root development. Because okay. again, when they're you know, building this house and yard, stuff's getting compacted and then they build a mound in the back and then they compact it so it doesn't erode. Oh. And so stuff was- So that's having a, with it too. Yeah, just, so just the, the hardness of the soil from compaction. Interesting. Compaction can have a lot to do with how well your plants do. Interesting. Yeah. So I will link a video um, below. I did a video on different types of soil and I talked about that soil web app that we were just talking about. So I'll link that below where you guys can have a link to that app and then how to actually use it. You wanna take the soil sample now? Sure. So I've got two tools with me. I've got a handy soil probe, uh, which most people are not going to have. Uh -huh. We use for collecting soil samples. And most people have a shovel. Yes. Well, the shovel's not my favorite tool to collect a soil sample because it's a lot of work. Okay. So uh, the first thing to do always, so this is a highly amended soil. You've been putting soil amendments in here yep. for quite a while. Yep. So we want to scrape any uh, just obvious residual uh, mulch and stuff off the surface of the soil prior to sampling. What's nice about this, this uh, tool is I can go down. Oh, wow. Inches very uh, quickly. Oh, look at that. And easily. <laughs> What's really nice is, is um, when you're collecting a soil sample, like I said, just to notice, you know, this, this, this soil here is, is relatively sandy. Uh, I think it might be even a little sandier than, than our soil. Uh, it doesn't ribbon at all. Um, it's got some moisture. Now, most people got a shovel and you're going to have to, you can see, it's going to take a whole lot more work right. to uh, get very deep, but we're in there, we're in there. So if you're using a shovel, um, don't just take it from one spot. Um, you might want to, you can see right here um, that it's a little, the soil's a little darker near uh -huh. the surface. Yeah. And it's a little lighter down below. Right. The darkness is off from all of your- um, Compost. Compost, yeah. soil amendments. So you want to kind of get an even slice of, of your soil um, going around there and uh, so a little bit there, a little bit here. And then what I'm going to do is kind of mix it up okay. to, to get a homogenous sample. Now you can see that Janie's already uh, uh, bringing in her, her compost here. My annual compost layer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's quite a bit of material for this uh, small patch. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> 
Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> so again, we're, we're kicking off some of the surface soil. And you notice I said soil, didn't say dirt. Oh. Y'all know the difference between soil and dirt, right? Just tell us. Well, soil's what's in the ground and dirt's what gets on your pants. <laughs> Old soil science joke. Okay, good one. <laughs> I put a quote at the top of every description <laughs> of a quote from Daniel. <laughs> I'm, I'm noticing just right over here in this little corner, it's a, ooh, it's a little harder. Yeah, this is where my sunflowers were. Okay. They were well, a complete fail this year. Well, I, can you pity those roots trying to penetrate this? <laughs> This, uh, this soil here um, <laughs> needs to be worked up a little oh, bit. Oh, God. <laughs> so you can see I didn't even get my my full 12 inches there. So that area could be the same problem your mother was having yeah. with the compaction. Yeah. What do, you, what do you think, huh? It's pretty tough. So you think that was the issue with the sunflowers? I think, I think so. Okay. Yeah, just, just having a hard time. Those poor roots having a hard time penetrating the soil okay and when you have a shallow root system you know it's going to have to be watered more frequently and fertilized more because it doesn't have the volume of soil to explore to get its uh, water and nutrients okay so what would you do to fix compact what would you recommend fixing compacted soil tilling so uh, nothing beats a shovel. No. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, rototillers, they, they tend to really beat the soil. They make the soil really fluffy in the top four inches. Uh -huh. And right at the bottom of where that little uh, rotary tiller goes, it shears the soil and makes a, um, actually compacts the soil below. Really? So it's super fluffy up top. And that, it, and especially if you do it repeated years in the same place, same depth, same rototiller, obviously it's going to be the same depth. <laughs> uh, you just create this hard spot. Oh. And um, there's nothing like uh, actually turning your soil, inverting it a little bit, getting some of that organic matter a little deeper than the four inches. Okay. Uh, really helps to uh, have nice moisture. And, you know, that's that's a lot of work. That's a lot you of know, work. On, on I'm... farms, we're just going to you know, pull a plow or a chisel right. uh, behind a tractor. Right. And, uh, but for the home here, gardener, the homeowner, yeah, it's, 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 it's work. Yeah. But once you, you incorporate a lot of compost and you, you get it down in there, um, it should, it should, uh, um, not get, not, not seal right back up. Okay. But yeah, so that's uh, good road to hear. killers, they, they, they're, they're pretty terrible. What? They'll make a wonderful seed bed, wonderful seed bed, and but, and in, in agriculture, we'll use rototillers, um, but that's after like doing some chiseling of the soil, so it's already shoot. loose, so it's not going to create that compact layer. Oh, this is Whereas so here, interesting. Because you're not pulling a chisel through here, um, and you're just doing the rototiller. Yeah, it's just going to make it's just going to stay just as hard below, and roots don't like developing in some something nice and easy and cush yeah and then all of a sudden hitting the hard layer and then they're not going to go any further yeah, than and that. then they're just going to hang a right turn okay so yeah. question for me yeah. i just bought a ryobi tiller <laughs> battery no power you know plug-in power tiller you think i should return it uh <laughs> no comment <laughs> jason's not going to be happy because he's probably going to get drafted into uh, <laughs> yes, being yeah. the workhorse, <laughs> turning the soil but over if, by if, hand. But if you think that that's the way to go, that's really interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just taking a shovel and flipping it over. Yeah. And, and and really waiting until your soil, you know, you can either water it to, um, you know, get it nice and, and, and moist and, and, you know, allow it, uh, you know, maybe a week to drain. Okay. Or if we get a, a nice rainfall, hmm. any of those would help to just turn the soil and incorporate this, uh, this compost. Okay. Into it. Yeah. So uh, we've, we've got some, uh, some soil here. We're mixing it up really nice. That's why I like the bucket. The bucket's just nice to um, put the soil in. You know, I always like collecting a little more soil than really is needed. Um, the different uh, tests run in different parts of the country 
require different amounts of soil. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So a lot of the uh, the Midwest labs, their their sample bags are half this size. Okay. Because um, they just do one extract for everything, whereas here in California, we uh, we make things more complicated, okay. and we do uh, m several different extracts for different um, nutrients and parameters on the soil, and one of them, which is called the uh, uh, the saturated paste extract, it's a water extract. Um, and it requires you know, about you know uh, this bag needs to be half full. For so it use, yeah, and then there's other tests where you're only using a teaspoon. Oh, interesting. But, so what we do when when this sample comes into the laboratory. We, we, dr we dry it, oh, probably maybe only 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, then we grind it and homogenize it because, as you saw, we had the uh, light yellow-brown soil, the dark brown soil, right. all kind of different. And so it's real important not only to, to homogenize our, our sample a little bit when, it, um, uh, when we're putting it in, in the bucket here, uh, so that we are sending to the lab something that's representative, but also then in the lab, once it is dried and ground, you know, basically kind of a powder, we, we homogenize it again, and then it goes uh, for um, extracting prior to analysis. Okay. So here is our, uh, our sample, and, uh, oh, I think I collected just the right amount. Can I see in the bag? Yeah. Okay. And uh, my rule of thumb with uh, most things, it's always good to have a, a little too much and a little too little. All right. So you're going to send that off to your lab. Yeah. And then how long does it take to get the results back? Um, our tests, because they're more extensive, generally take about a week. Okay. Um, some of the uh, labs in the Midwest that just do the one extract, uh -huh. oh, they can get stuff out, you know in two three days okay yeah. okay all right this is awesome thank you for doing this for me yeah. i appreciate it and so, we'll uh we'll review the results uh next time not will you be on camera next time sure. thank you daniel <laughs> i have the best neighbors i always i always brag about my neighborhood and my neighborhood <laughs> So for everybody out there that doesn't have a Daniel that lives next door to them, how would you recommend people find a, you know, a good soil testing company? Um, well, you know what everybody does nowadays, you just go online and you uh, search, you know, soil testing in whatever state you're in. Okay. Uh, which is a good place to start. And there's different labs. Uh, you know, starting with somebody nearby you is probably easy. Okay. I, um, some of the... Uh, I know some of the states back east, like Pennsylvania, they've got, um, well, a lot of the land-grant universities with agriculture programs. They have analytical laboratories. Some of them uh, serve the public uh -huh. uh, as well as the university, and some of them only serve the university. Okay. So, and then some uh, states don't have any. Okay. So, for example, our company, we've, we've gotten inquiries and uh, samples, for example, from New Mexico. Oh, interesting. Where, uh, the, the state university there. Uh, the university contacted us because they themselves didn't have a, um, a laboratory. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And they're probably pretty similar to us with well, yeah. dry, New, New arid. New Mexico is, yeah. would, would be using the same methods as, as we use. So it would be appropriate. Yeah. yeah, it's western states. It's west of the Rockies. Okay, yeah. awesome. Um, but you can uh, search soil testing. Also, um, you know, most states have a, a, a um, cooperative extension or agricultural extension service, mm -hmm. and they would have information online for, for soil testing. Right. So I, I would uh, encourage everybody to stay within their state. Okay. Um, the other thing is once you do get results, and you'll, you'll see ours, everybody, every laboratory's got different... Uh, ways of presenting their data. Right. Uh, we like some better than others. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it and, and it's hard, you know, to, to take something complex like soil science and distill it for a lay person. Uh -huh. And so I think some laboratories maybe oversimplify. Okay. Uh, but, you know, it, everybody's got to make an attempt. How do you, you know, people aren't going to understand uh, what my parts per million phosphorus means. Just tell me, is it high or low? Yeah. You know, tell <laughs> Good me or down. bad? Yeah. Green light or red light? Yeah. yeah. So, um, and I think most laboratories have 
that on their reports, giving you a interpretation of what's high and what's low. Okay. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much for this. I really, really appreciate it. And I'm sure everybody watching does too. All right. Hey everyone, it is 10 days later and Daniel is back with my results. Are they bad? Are they good? They're fine. Oh. <laughs> so what we have here is not surprising at all. Okay. I almost could have predicted it. That's not a very good sales for getting your soil <laughs> tested, but as I, as I saw in the, when you had the corn back there. So it was the your, corn that told you? Your decorative corn had classic nitrogen deficiency symptoms. Okay. And yes, indeed, there is almost no residual nitrate nitrogen in the soil. Okay. Yeah. So that so, explains so that, it. So that's very, very simple to correct. Okay. Um, all of our other nutrients are actually very strong, kind of okay. high, which is good. Okay. I mean, you know, there's a lot of fertilizer been applied here um, over the years. Our phosphorus is good. Our potassium is good. Our zinc is through the roof, but that's not a problem. It's not, okay. No, it's it's just way more than is needed. And obviously there was some, oh, probably a complete fertilizer containing zinc applied in the past. Okay. And if you have high zinc, that's not a problem. Okay. We've got very good organic matter and we're just adding a lot adding more, more here. Than that. So that's even going to be more. Okay. And again, it's one of those things where you just can't have too much organic matter. Right. Organic yeah. matter holds nutrients and water and is good for your soil tilth. But the other thing that's good for your soil tilth is calcium. Okay. And the calcium in this soil test is very, very low. Okay. And it's, and it's actually lower than magnesium. Okay. And, and, and so when you have more magnesium in your soil than calcium, it tends to kind of set up kind of hard. Okay. And so there's a lot of talk in our agricultural industry about calcium magnesium ratios and ideal ratios. And there isn't necessarily an ideal ratio, but it is absolutely not ideal to have more magnesium than calcium. To have it backwards. Yeah, okay. which is the case here. We have okay. more magnesium than calcium. All right. And our calcium magnesium ratio is about, it's about one to one. Okay. So when it comes to everything else, you know, our pH is relatively neutral. Our salinity is low. What was, what was my pH? 7.4. Okay. All right. So that's that's almost ideal. It's okay. relatively neutral. Great. So it's great for um, nutrient availability. Um, the other thing is there's, even though our total salts are low, we have more sodium than calcium, which again is not good. Okay. Because sodium, okay, we're going to, we're going to use a $5 word here. Uh -oh. Sodium is a monovalent cation, <laughs> <laughs> which means it has one plus charge, monovalent. one plus charge, whereas calcium has got two plus charges. Okay. My chemistry is yeah. coming back to me. <laughs> okay. And, and, and the reason that's important is, uh, uh, you have to think of, it's all got to do with electrical charge in the soil. Um, and when you have calcium, they have two positive charges and think of like the two positive ends of a magnet uh -huh. and you put them together. They want to push each other apart. Yeah. yeah. And so the more of that calcium the, with two positive charges on the calcium, it wants to push them apart and it helps to maintain good soil structure. Oh, okay. And when you have Keeps things loose. Yeah, when okay. you have too much sodium, which has only got the one plus, it's a weaker push. Wow. So it doesn't keep the soil as well flocculated. Oh my goodness. Yeah. This is interesting. So especially for seed bed preparation, okay. it's nice to have high calcium levels. Okay. Uh, so you just have good tilth. And tilth has got to do with the structure and friability of the soil. Okay. It's kind of a, a, a quality thing. Okay. Um, a good growing environment. Yeah. And you can't fake that with a tiller. No, you cannot. <laughs> you cannot. We have 
our, our calcium, our soluble calcium is less than our soluble magnesium. So that's not great. Okay. And it's also less than our soluble sodium. sodium. So we've got twice as much sodium as we do calcium. Okay. So to remedy that, we have the certified crop advisors uh, <laughs> recommendation for a gypsum application. All and I, right. look at a, I look at a soil test report like this and I go, you know, that needs five tons per acre of gypsum. Okay. Well, All then right. we convert the five tons per acre down to square feet. Uh huh. So, um, so I know. You did the math. I know Thank off the top, top of my head <laughs> uh, that going from tons per acre to 1,000 square feet, which is what a lot of landscape people think in terms of, okay. I just multiply by 2%. So I take that 10,000 pounds. So your math class paid off. Well, this is this, this, <laughs> math this, and chemistry this paid ba off. basic arithmetic, basic arithmetic. So when my girls ask, why do I have to do this? Yeah. It's, well, go talk to Daniel. I, I use it all the time. Okay, yeah. there you go. So the, the five tons per acre of gypsum, that would be 10,000 pounds per acre. I multiply by 2%. It gives me 200 pounds of gypsum per 1,000 square feet. Okay. And as you told me, this measures 200. 10 feet by 20 feet, uh -huh. which is 200 square feet. Uh -huh. So that 200 square feet is one fifth of the thousand right. uh, square feet. So it comes out to 40 pounds of gypsum okay. in this 200 square foot area. Okay. And guess what I brought you? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Look at what my wonderful neighbor brings me. <laughs> This is awesome. A, a sack of gypsum, and as you can see, it's a little messy. Uh huh. Uh, and so this is going to bring my calcium level up. This will bring your calcium level up. It's okay. 40 pounds, and it is ultra fine. I see it. Gypsum. <laughs> and gypsum is calcium sulfate. Okay. Dihydrate. It's got water molecules in it. Okay. And that helps to. Um, make it go into solution readily. Okay. So this is to fix the calcium. What about the nitrogen? Just so with the nitrogen, um, you know, with, with fertilizers, you go to the uh, store, you buy fertilizer. It's always got your three numbers on uh -huh. there. NPK. NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Uh, so you're looking for something with, with higher nitrogen. Okay. How often do you think I have to replenish this gypsum is it do you think it's a yearly thing um i would i would probably do it next year as well but okay. once you've done it two years in a row you're, you're you've probably built up some some pretty healthy levels okay thank you so much for all of this you are an awesome neighbor my question is should should the average homeowner think about doing something like this calling their absolutely, local absolutely and, and i'm not you know plugging our company yeah well i am I, yeah but i i, I, I do <laughs> i do want to encourage people to uh, you know, seek out a laboratory in their state. Local. Um, some states don't have laboratories. I think I mentioned last time, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes we get samples from New Mexico because um, like the university down there doesn't have a laboratory. Right, there yeah. Are private laboratories in many, many states. So work with a laboratory in your state or in your region so that they're doing the appropriate tests. Okay. You know, we and not buying the over-the-counter. Yeah, no, don't, don't bother <laughs> with the over-the-counter stuff. Like I did. Yeah. And your, your test results said that you were low in Deficient everything. Deficient in absolutely everything, yeah. right? When we're here, we see that we've actually got very robust levels <laughs> of phosphorus and potassium. Which is funny because it yeah. said I was low, I was deficient in phosphorus. Okay. So <laughs> we have all your levels here and you got a lot of work in front of you. Yeah, I do. <laughs> All right, you guys. Well, I hope that was as interesting for you as it was for me. Thank you so much, Daniel, for bet? taking the time yeah. to help out your neighbor. You're <laughs> awesome. And yeah, I got I got some work to do, you guys. Okay. So I hope you all enjoyed this, and I hope you all have a chance to get into your garden today.